get started. This should be a lot of fun. So this is the third session of Lightning Talks at Open Aperio. I am not Martin Ramsey. I am not from the LAMP Learning Consortium. I'm Josh Wilson from Longsight. Martin had to step away, and I thought it would be fun to uh, gain a few extra gray hairs and step in in his place. So I'm going to do my best to be my very best Martin, and we'll see how that goes. All right. So let's let's get to it. Um, so just want to note that we have we've got about let's see how many people do we have. We have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight presenters in a total of six lightning talks. So we've got people from all over the world. We've got people from Indiana and Florida in the states. We've got folks from France. Um, we've got people from South Africa, and we've got uh, people from Pepperdine University in California and the University of Virginia. So, so some folks from the states, some folks from Europe, some folks from South Africa. It should be a pretty interesting session. Uh, Martin always talks about the, uh, the the global nature of these of these lightning talks, and that's that's always pretty exciting. So presenters, Kathy has made you all moderators. So what that means is that you can grab presenter rights when it's your turn. I'm not going to introduce you beyond just giving your name because these sessions are short and I want to make sure that that you have uh, the time that you need. I'm going to give you uh, a five minute warning and a one minute warning. Um, I don't have Martin's clock, so I'll have to use fingers instead, but that'll be uh, part of the fun of this session. So with that said, let us get started. So we're going to start with Derek Ramsey, who's going to talk about new features in Sakai 21. Derek, take it away. I think Derek might be having an issue with audio. Yeah, I saw in the chat, he said no audio. All right, so Derek, I have Derek, an idea for you. Try um, refreshing, that's what I had to do. When I refreshed it, let me go through the audio check. Derek was in just as a viewer, so I just promoted him to moderator and it looks like he's going through the process of reconnecting to the audio. So if you could give it just a minute. Kathy to the rescue once again. Okay, <laughs> refresh did it, Wilma, thank you. All right, good stuff. All right, now I just need Let's to do still it, presenter option here. I heard you say that. I could get presenter option. I'm looking for that. Take presenter. So, okay. Yep, you got it. Great. All right, can you guys see my screen okay? Yes, we can. Okay, sorry about the delay here. So yes, uh, gonna do a quick presentation on some of the new features here in Sakai 21. So Sakai 21 was released on 3.18. Uh, Sakai 21.1 will be released very soon. Uh, Try to get it out last week, hit a few hiccups uh, with the uh, Aperio conference this week. Um, Probably not going to get out this week, but early next week uh, should be doable uh, via talking to some of the devs. Um, one of the first cool new features out there in Sakai 21 that was stealth until right when 21.1 comes out is dark mode. Um, uh, it's a feature that uh, individuals can toggle on and off on their own. Uh, those users will be able to toggle that from uh, once they're logged into Sakai in the top right corner where their initials are. Uh, they select that option, come down dark theme, and they can toggle that on and off as they see uh, fit for themselves to use. Um, like I said, uh, 21.0, um, I think uh, stealth by default, but there has been many bug fixes uh, in dark mode over the past month. I think there's been somewhere around 12 or 15 in the past month resolved, and uh, those guys are still knocking those out. So great on that. Uh, we have the dashboard uh, new in Sakai 21 as well. Um, it is stealthed um, by default. Um, so it's 
if, if you have some faculty members wanting to use it or wanting to go through a small pilot phase, you would add this to your site just as you would any other stealth tool in Sakai by using admin workspace and sites. Setting it up uh, gives the instructors some more flexibility um, in their dashboard, a new kind of clean looking UI. You see they have some options when they come into the layout to kind of choose some different options on how they want their uh, over their dashboard to look. So it's kind of taking place of the current overview tool. Um, so like I said, though, this is stealth by default in 21. Uh, here at Longsite, we do have a couple clients already on uh, 21 on either production or dev, and they're starting to take a look at it. So hopefully get some good feedback on it uh, here shortly. Uh, the gradebook got a couple new options here. Category averages are now exportable. That's going to be your left side uh, image here. So instructors, when they go in to export, they have a new option here uh, to export and uh, messaging. So uh, messaging in the gradebook came out in Sakai 20. I believe Adrian done that work um, and it just picks up some additional um, options for emailing uh, students, uh, such as you can see here. Uh, this is set up currently for greatest students based on a certain score. Um, and at any time, if faculty members do use this option to email out students based on certain criteria, there is a log. So uh, if the instructor ever wonders, you know, I wonder what all students that did uh, go out to, they can come back in at a later time and view the log to see what all students should have received that email. Uh, University of Dayton uh, contributed back some work for lessons. Um, so as you see here, um, add edit dialogue. So as an instructor, when they go in to create a lesson, um, if they click that uh, option at the top uh, to add tools, uh, this is the new layout in Sakai 21 um, plus here. So a little cleaner UI. Um, and they also got a new layout option. Uh, the layout option is uh, at the top of the page, uh, if you're familiar with lessons at all, you have like the tools, the more tools, the settings icon, there's a new button there. It says layout. So the instructors can come in and at, right when they start making a lesson page, select add new layout and choose from one of these uh, default options. Uh, reorder, um, if you've used reorder in the past in lessons, um, it's, you know, little bit unappealing to the eye like some of these items are real close together the spacing is not well um, the items aren't outlined very well um, some of the items in lessons it's kind of generic it's hard for the instructor if they have a large um, lesson page it's hard to, for them exactly to see um, what some of the items are um, such as links and text so it's cleaned up in sakai 21 plus nice breaks uh, between each item and easily uh, distinguishable between them and easy to move those around and delete if needed. Uh, time release indicators uh, in previous versions of Sakai, um, when an instructor set an item to be released on a certain date, uh, it would show something like you would see here on the left, not released until. Once that date is met, that indicator would just go away and it would be available. Um, in Sakai uh, 21 plus, you're going to get another indicator that shows you that it actually was released. So just another indicator to the instructor that that item, you know, was a uh, date time released item and it has been met. So Derek, that is your five minute time limit. That was quick. Um, and I apologize for the audio issues. Um, I'm going to put these slides up in resources in the Aperio Slack. Um, but I can try to, I think I got another minute here. Let me squeeze in the rubrics. Um, ability to search, uh, pretty easy there. Um, you know, as, as time goes on, uh, you know, you can get a lot of rubrics put in. So you got search, rubrics, weighted criteria. Um, the option here, um, it's, it's, it's not real clear right now, but the percent sign. So you see here, that's your standard rubric. If an instructor presses that, it can change it over to weighted rubrics, some LTI advantage improvements. Um, a big one here is LTI assignment types so that the instructor can uh, link an assignment tool to an LTI tool and copy these items here. Um, if you got a 1.3, there's a lot more information. It's hard to move all that around. So there's copy buttons uh, in the LTI um, tool itself to pull some of those IDs. Uh, so a lot of information, short amount of time. I'll put these slides up um, in a resource item that anyone can grab that's in the site. All right, thanks, Derek. 
Next up will be Stephanie Schlutenhofer, and I probably mispronounced your name. I did my best. I'm very sorry. Stephanie's going to be speaking about the power of calendar subscriptions in Unitime. So, Stephanie, you're you're welcome to grab presenter rights and get started. And your your time starts now. Okay. Mostly, um, I'm going to talk. We've got a useful little button on Unitime that it appears in about anywhere you've got schedules displayed and this button will let you to export um, items in an out calendar format and you can actually subscribe to these so they stay up to date as things change and actually let me go demo this now um, let me share my screen and okay Basically, on this, um, one, one place this is used is in the personal schedule. Um, if I do a search on my personal schedule, I've got a few demo events here. I hit export, iCal, it brings it up. Um, I've already subscribed to this one in my um, iCalendar, and you can see my demo events. But what's fun with this is you can go places like into the events and let's say I do a room search. I'm in charge of uh, making sure the seats are lined up correctly in this ME room. I can also export a iCalendar for this. I can also export it in a PDF and other formats, but I can put it into an iCal. I can copy that. I can go into my calendar here. My calendar. Things are slow. There we go. And I can subscribe. Paste it in there, subscribe, pulls it in, and now when my screen updates, uh, all of the events that are in that room show up on my calendar. Um, so let me get out of this. I'm going to go back to my personal schedule. Unit time. And I'm going to show that this does indeed, if I get rid of one of my demo events here, I edit this, I decide I want to cancel it, I can cancel this event. And then if I flip back to my calendar here and refresh, you'll see that both the um, room calendar and my personal calendar will show this event disappearing. And uh, that's pretty much all there is to this button. It appears um, in lots of places. It appears when the students look at their schedules. It appears um, whenever you're searching for events. Um, there are lots of places where it occurs. So let's see if I can stop sharing here. Back. And so if anyone has questions on this, um, feel free to put them in the shared notes and I'll answer. So we have about 50 seconds left in uh, in Stephanie's slot. So if there is a question, we probably can pose it. A succinct question with a succinct answer. Otherwise, I'm happy to let someone else do their talk. That's right. So questions can also go in the in the, the forum that's attached to this lightning talk. So you can post your questions for presenters there, and they can they can respond as well. All right. 
let us move on then. Thank you, Stephanie, for that presentation. Let's move on to uh, Julian Gribonval. Um, so Julian has two videos that he's going to show us, uh, one about uPortal and web components, and one is a web component showcase, which I, I guess is also related to uPortal. So Julian, you can take presenter rights and you can get your video started. Hi folks, so um, let me launch in the video. So the video is only a demo and I will talk at the same time. Um, so firstly, uh, the demo is to uh, on how to install uh, uPortal, and uh, like uh, you can see, it's uh, begin by a clone. Um, during the clone, I just want to apologize for my uh, Frenglish. Um, I hope that uh, people also will uh, understand uh, me correctly. So. Um, the demo is uh, to uh, to show that uh, uPortal can be installed uh, quickly with uh, less commands. Uh, I mean, uh, with uh, less than ten commands, you can uh, install and uh, run uh, uPortal. So uh, during uh, this tape, uh, we have again. Uh, we have always to download uh, uh, things. Yes, okay, good. So uh, now we can start to uh, to begin to configure. It, uh, begin by the Java version, uh, Java 8. And uh, from uh, this step, you can launch Gradle to obtain all tasks available. Uh, uPortal Start is a, is a client that permits to install uPortal easily. Uh, the next step is to configure your install directory uh, where uh, you will uh, install, uh, deploy Tomcat and uh, uPortal and uh, Portlet services. Uh, and uh, after we are, you have to, uh, to run uh, and embedded uh, database, and uh, you can uh, launch the portal in it after that. It will um, deploy all applications into the path that you define. Uh, also, it uh, deploy uh, and uh, generate all databases provided into the client. By default, you have nothing to do. Uh, so uh, all is uh, created and uh, deployed at the same time. Uh, this client is uh, really important and easy to use uh, for deployment. And you can add your custom apps from uh, into it. And so now you can launch the Tomcat start. So that's a longer part. Uh, it takes some seconds to, to run Tomcat, always Tomcat, uh, but uh, it's not uh, really complicated, complicated until now. So, waiting. Um, okay, let's go. Uh, so no, it's uh, the browser running on localhost, and you access to your portal. It's embed uh, a CAS to authenticate, and uh, as you can see, you have an admin. Uportal view with some already installed web components. Uh, 
the administrator dashboard is a web component. And uh, before we, we have seen um, the waffle menu. That's all, no, sorry, <laughs> thanks. Um, I will move to the next uh, part. My second demo video. Uh, well, so it's more easy for me to uh, to uh, to talk about you portal in this way uh, because I'm not really familiar with uh, English. And it's a bit difficult for me to concentrate and uh, make a demo at the same time. Okay, the second part is about web new portal web components. On the Git repository, you have uh, the main part of all web components, and uh, each uh, web components have uh, generally a documentation on how to uh, to install it, and uh, it provides an, um, a demo page to show how they can be used and what they do. It's a simple way. On the first moment, we have the waffle menu, and this part is the SCO content menu, the rich chest web component uh, that I, we have done. Um, I will show you how it's easy to, um, to complete and add more uh, configurations. Uh, this example is uh, how to uh, deploy uh, the hamburger menu with uh, which embed the um, SCO content menu, uh, a complete page and a complicated complex page uh, that contains uh, a lot of uh, web components that permit to access to all services uh, of uh, all user services inside the portal, available inside the portal. So we are back to the portal after the deployment. And we can see that uh, the new hamburger menu that permits to access to a list of services with a custom page. So you have uh, some favorites and stuff around that. Um, now I will show you how to uh, make some configurations uh, to the admin dashboard to uh, to change um, the filter on the portlet re registry. Um, we can use, uh, we can show all services uh, from category, all categories, but uh, we can uh, filter on uh, other available uh, settings like favorites. And uh, web components are really, really easy to configure and uh, and use uh, from near and nothing. So we re-import uh, portlet definitions. Just some deployment of uh, portlet definitions and. Uh, after so that, we have only to refresh the portal. I prefer the, um, the fi XML files to deploy, but we can also uh, deploy from uh, CMS uh, portlets. So on the previous, on, on this page, page, you can see as that we have only favorites. We can do the same thing with the waffle menu. We can filter uh, on favorites only. Uh, it was on category quick links. And after the update, you will see that we will get only favorites from one button. So web components are really, really important for, for me because uh, they can, uh, they permit a lot of things without uh, modifying uh, 
you portal sources as example, but it's uh, valuable for any projects. And uh, you can customize the UI easily with a, a simple component. So that's all. All right, Julian, thank you so much. Yes. Um, there was a, a conversation in the chat about Martin's special deal with you that you got two five minute slots. So thank you for packing a lot of information into a, a pretty short period of time. So we're, we're grateful. All right, um, moving on now. The next presenter is gonna be Wilma Hodges from Longsight who needs no introduction. She's gonna talk a little bit about the new meetings tool. So Wilma, take it away. All right, hello everybody. Um, so my uh, my five minutes are about meeting the new meetings tool. Um, so just to kind of set the stage a little bit, um, as we all know and have experienced the sort of upheaval that COVID caused when it, it came onto the scene um, and it resulted in a, a flurry of e-learning or remote teaching or um, you know, anything physically distant to help manage the pandemic, um, which also resulted in a whole lot of Zoom calls or WebEx meetings and um, sort of that virtual meeting uh, took really a, a huge um, chunk of the, the learning that, that was happening online um, to be able to provide that sort of interaction. So when we think about it in terms of uh, the LMS, Sakai specifically, um, we wanted to think, well, you know, online learning is certainly not going to go away. It's sort of blossomed into this, you know, um, mainstream thing now. And so even beyond the pandemic, we want to find ways to leverage that sort of, um, you know, virtual interaction with folks and make it more social, kind of make it easier to um, have people feel like they're they're part of the conversation and can easily um, talk to folks in their online courses. So that's kind of the thinking that came behind this. Um, so you know what makes the interface more social. Um, so I thought about ways that you know you might surface the user profile, um, make it easier to connect, a friendlier interface to integrate with video or virtual meeting chat. Um, an easy way to notify users that there's a meeting happening or one that's upcoming. So some examples might be um, being able to see the numbers currently in a meeting, um, maybe coming um, a, a, a place that alerts you about coming events, meetings you can join, that sort of thing. Um, so for those of you who don't know, there is a meetings tool, it's a contrib tool, so not everybody's using it. Um, but we're looking, um, Longsight is looking at a project to enhance this tool. And we're targeting these improvements for Sakai 22. Um, we've uh, brought a UX design uh, firm on board. So we have somebody contracted to help us kind of imagine what this might look like, make it a, a very attractive UI. And um, this is the meetings tool now. It's sort of the before picture, right? So this is current state. Um, it's currently the, the Big Blue Button API integration. For those of you who use Big Blue Button, you may have seen this. Um, if you're using something else, maybe you're not using the Meetings Contrib tool at all. But currently, you can create meetings in here. Um, they would be listed there. When you go to an individual meeting, you see any details. There's a spot for description and a link to join the meeting. And then um, if there's a meeting in progress, you do see the number of folks in there and you see if they're attendees or moderators, but that's really all the, the information that you get about the people that are in the session. Um, and then when there's a recording, it's on a separate tab. Um, and so there's kind of a list there of any recordings in the, the site um, pertaining to that particular uh, meetings tool. So um, brainstorming ideas for meetings, um, kind of 2.0, uh, what if it could display events for more than one meeting on a single page? Because right now it's very segmented. Um, and maybe it could display the users in each meeting in a more visual way. Um, and we looked at things like um, Engagely or Congregate, where you sort of see the little thumbnails of people and you know who's in there, not just how many. Um, and what if it could also work with your choice of tools? So not just Big Blue Button, but maybe something that could also allow you to use the same meetings interface, 
but hook it into Zoom or Teams or whatever other tool you want to use. Um, and we also wanted to make it web component um, eyes, <laughs> that's a made up word, um, to be able to drop it into different places and not be kind of siloed in the meetings um, tool. So we've got some initial designs and I'm just gonna fly through these really quickly. These are some initial designs from our um, UX designer. We've got kind of this table format idea where the thumbnails might appear or gathered around a table. You can see how many users are in there. You've got future and past meetings kind of grouped on the page. Um, there's also another sort of card style that we're kind of playing with to see which one resonates more with, with people. Um, and again, you've got your future and your past. And if there's any things that go with the presentation, like a recording link or slides, those could be surfaced. Um, we're also looking at templates for creating meetings to have some sort of default setup so it's easier to make a meeting. Um, and then also the web component idea that you could actually have links to meetings from maybe, maybe the calendar or the dashboard or other places, a lessons page, um, wherever you want to place those meetings. So, um, so that's kind of what we're thinking. And we'd love to hear what you would like. So um, I kind of co-opted one of the ad hoc meeting spaces. There are some ad hoc rooms available. So I grabbed one and there's a bitly for it. Or you can go, I think it's room one. It's in that ad hoc sign up sheet as well. There's the, the long link. But at two o'clock today, um, we'd like to encourage you to come and meet with us there and talk a little bit about what you would like to see in an enhanced meetings tool for Sakai. So um, hopefully I made my time. Good? Close enough. So right. thank you. Thank you, Wilma. That was that was great. So definitely I encourage folks to join us at 2 p.m. today for this meeting. So come and give your feedback about meetings. A meeting about meetings that's what we all need more of all right let's let's move on now to south africa where uh sam lee pan and reiner gearman are going to talk about opencast studio in action so you guys can grab presenter rights and take it away all right great great thank you very much um can you see my screen not yet um, uh, right, okay, I've got it. There we go. Should see it now. Great. It's coming. Great. We got it. Thank you. All right, Sam. Uh, is Sam still in? Uh, hi, I'm, yeah. Okay. Thanks. Thanks, Rai. Um, so we're going to kick off with a question, actually. I'm popping it into the chat. And last year, um, I think there's some noise coming through on your side. Okay, I'll mute myself for now. <laughs> All right, thanks. Um, so if we move to the next slide, essentially um, when we went online last year with COVID, um, how did everyone find that they pre-recorded their teaching videos? And that was quite a big, yeah, I think there was a lot of usage of Zoom, but there was also a lot of other screencasting software that was used. So, um, right, if we go on. Um, so we were, we didn't have a lot of Zoom licenses at that stage, and we, there were different softwares that we did look at. Um, and some of the open source ones were nice, but they weren't that user friendly. Um, and some of them were um, like screencast matic It was really user friendly, but then there's limits like 15 minutes or there's this annoying watermark. So there's this whole range of different softwares and licenses. And um, yeah, you have to kind of know what to recommend to the lecturer. Um, so if we move on, we found OpenCast and we were very fortunate enough um, to, to host OpenCast locally. Um, but it does run in the browser, um, so there's no, there's not that much overhead from the server side, and we'll even take you through a demo just now, which shows you can even use it um, on the on the live site. Uh, so it's got your your camera, your screen sharing. It allows for simple trimming, so that's new features that's been added. It's supported in five languages. You can download the file um, at that point, or you can upload it into the LMS if you have an OpenCast server. So that links up to the um, OpenCast server. 
Um, but the like the really nice thing is also it doesn't have those limitations like um, watermarks. And the limitations will only be with regards to how like time limits according to how much your your browser can can manage. Um, great, thanks. Greg's also adding um, different language options uh, that you can add to. Uh, so now, if we look at OpenCast at UCT, um, we had about sixteen thousand video uploads last year. At least three thousand of these were from OpenCast. Studio directly. As I mentioned, you can also download onto your computer and then upload at a later time. So a lot of people chose to do that. So that and th three thousand, that like about one fifth, is probably a large underrepresentation. So it was very popular. Um, and though there were one or two niggly things, right? I can tell you about those. I think overall, people like like ninety ninety five or more percent people were really really happy about it. It was great. Um, and then if we go on to where do you find OpenCast? So, so to find OpenCast Studio, you can actually even find this on the Perio website. Um, and the developer code is there for the developers in the room. So there is, um, thank you, especially to the Elan team, which has done amazing work to get this all production ready, especially last year. Um, and then one of our previous developers, Duncan Smith, that worked on it, to kickstart it like quite a few years ago. So yeah, um, it's exciting seeing it live and in production and just really useful for our purposes. Um, and then Rai's gonna take us through the link, um, which will, yeah, he's gonna do a live demo for us. Hi everybody. <clears throat> yes, yeah, so hi. Uh, so Greg has put in the link there if you guys would like to try OpenCore Studio yourselves. Uh, but I'll just going to take you through a quick demo now. Uh, just give me one second. All right, so this is OpenCore Studio. As Sam said, it is browser-based, so you don't necessarily need any fancy software or anything like that. It just runs in your browser. So you've got some options here. You can either just uh, record just the display, so that will just be your PowerPoint or uh, a PDF or something like that. Uh, display and camera, which it will simultaneously record your display and your camera or if you just want to display your, your camera you can select the third option but for today's uh, demonstration I'm going to do the middle one display and camera all right so it will the browser will ask you which camera you would like to use so I'm just going to go with my webcam um, and then nextly it, after that it will ask you which uh, application you would want to record uh, I'm just running a very old webcam at the moment, so it might not pick up immediately. Right, I just want to note that you have about one minute left. Okay, no problem at all. Um, yeah, I, th I think it's my camera that does this sometimes. Apologies. I'm sure if I just restart this process, it will... There we go. There's the big face reveal everybody wanted. <laughs> okay, then I'm just going to go here to select my PowerPoint presentation, and we can go off to next. Then I'll choose I uh, want to record with my microphone. Uh, once again, it will ask you which device you would want to record from. So I'm just going to choose my web webcam in this instance. And you can actually see the audio levels there just to ensure that audio is coming through the system at the moment. And next, and we hit record. And right, once it's recording, you can go through your PowerPoint slides as usual. Um, you can talk about your topics. Okay, and then once you are done with the recording, you can click stop. All right, so here you can review your recording, and it's also got some basic editing functionality. So it's just the top and tail, as I like to say. So you can take off a little bit in the beginning and a little bit at the end. It's mostly for like when you're trying to get everything ready, or you click record and you're getting your towards yourself or if you end the recording and you close your app or you close your, your PowerPoint you can edit those things out All right then once you're happy you can go next and then on the right hand side you'll be able to download the videos um, in uh, I think in Firefox it's WebM format but could also be MKV in Chrome I believe um, and then if you have OpenCast linked uh, via your LMS, you'll just be able to upload here directly. So we can just say it is recording. 
Recording and it's the presenter name at the bottom. And if I click here, it should upload to directly to OpenCast. And then once that is done, um, it will be published to your course site. So, for example, over here, you've got our list of videos at the bottom, um, and it will show you the list of videos here. Great. Um, and that's just a quick demo of OpenCast Studio. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, any questions, or Sam, would you like to say anything? No. I think at this that point we should, we should move on to our, our final lightning talk. We have about five minutes left in this session. So, um, so thanks to uh, to Sam and to Rai for that, uh, that that OpenCast demo. Definitely pretty interesting, and I, I agree with Dr. Chuck. It's uh, it's pretty exciting in its simplicity. All right, let's uh, let's wrap up this session with with a uh, lightning talk on demystifying tests and quizzes settings. So this is the uh, the team of John Buckingham and Tiffany Stahl. John is from Pepperdine University, Tiffany from the University of Virginia. So um, take it away, guys. Awesome. Um, let me see if I can take control of that. Oh, I, I did, John. Oh, you did? OK. Yeah. OK. Do you want to? Um, you want to start? Mm -hmm. and... Yeah. Great. OK. All right. All right. Well, we'll go ahead and get started. Um, thank you all so much for um, uh, let me actually turn on my, my webcam here. I just realized that it was not turned on. So thank you for bearing with me here. There we go. All right. Thank you all so much for for um, uh, attending our, um, our little lightning talk here on demystifying the uh, test and quizzes settings. Um, basically, what this is about is um, at our institutions, Tiffany and I have encountered a lot of confusion around uh, the settings in uh, the test and quizzes tool. Um, there are a lot of options in that tool, and there's a lot of complicated and ambiguous text uh, that these uh, settings refer to, and so um, you know we're we're coming from the position that if there is a if there's a way to make uh, a lot of these these items clearer, um, then users uh, instructors will be able to choose the right settings for them at the appropriate times. Um, so we actually have uh, in that effort we've got uh, you'll see here on this this list um, this uh, this slide here for resources we've got. Um, a few JIRAs. Uh, one is uh, settings, text changes. So there's there's some text changes, a lot of text changes that we really want to make. Um, some of these we actually consider to be low hanging fruit. That that is, uh, some of these could be can, could be changed by uh, virtue of the the, the message bundle manager. Um, but we're also really proposing that all of these changes become standard. Um, for all uh, all Sakai institutions, uh, and of course there would be. Uh, there's always going to be wiggle room uh, for other institutions to update or change uh, some of the some of the languages themselves. Again, using that message bundle manager, um, and so the, a lot of these these changes would require. You know, if it does become standard, it would become uh, needed to. Uh, it would require a developer work. And so here, uh, thank you, Tiffany, for for putting those uh, in the chat. You'll see um, SAK three four six seven four. These are. Uh, the settings text changes that we are proposing, um, and so you'll you'll be able to see some some good resources there. We also have uh, in this uh, on the slide here message bundles for textual updates, and this is actually where um, all of the textual uh, changes can be found by virtue of using the message bundle manager. Um, and then at the same time, there's also another JIRA here for uh, SAK34323 um, about making uh, updates to the exceptions UI. Uh, the exceptions UI is really, really important. Exceptions, um, I'm sure we've all, a lot of us have gotten uh, used to the uh, used to this awesome feature lately. And so uh, there are some, some suggestions and improvements that we're proposing uh, to make it so that uh, uh, exceptions is a little bit more clear and intuitive in using. Um, and of course, this would also require um, a developer intervention. And so um, that's just a very, very quick introduction. And so I'm going to go ahead and hand this off here to Tiffany, who will um, show you uh, some of the items that we have in mind and a few examples.
Yep, uh, so I'm going to share my screen here. So I have here uh, on the left uh, UVA's uh, instance of Sakai 20, where I've made some of the text changes using the message bundle manager um, that John mentioned. Um, one of the, uh, the major changes that uh, we'd like to make is to uh, give the dates uh, sort of meaningful labels that we can point users to and uh, make them more accessible. So for example, in the nightly server here, we can see it is available, it is due, and then we have this late submissions accepted until question uh, with date fields uh, associated with them. So um, the late submission date or uh, due date, the various assessment uh, ending settings, retract date can be either one of those. So I've renamed them uh, to available date, due date, and final submission deadline uh, being either the due date or a late submission deadline, uh, depending on what the instructor chooses. Um, another piece that we get a lot of confusion about is the immediate feedback uh, piece, which is where uh, feedback is revealed to the student while they're taking an assessment. Uh, so uh, that is uh, something that we've changed here to a long sentence to tell the instructor that that's exactly what will happen. They'll see the feedback uh, while taking the assessment and they can change their answers accordingly. Um, and finally, I wanted to share the exceptions UI uh, that uh, Mitch Dunn at UVA uh, developer has done some excellent work on improving. Um, the exceptions UI in uh, Sakai currently is very confusing. It has a very long explanatory text at the bottom explaining how to use it. You should never need that in, in a, um, a UI to explain uh, the, the settings away. Um, so right now you have these fields. It has a time limit of zero minutes and zero hours. Uh, to set it for unlimited time. So, um, and also these, these empty date fields are actually inheriting the dates um, for uh, the overall assessment, which is extremely confusing. Uh, and it doesn't tell you that in the uh, exceptions table. So there's actually a due date and a late submission date enabled here. Um, and, uh, and that's confusing. So uh, one of the things we've done at UVA is to uh, make it so that when you select a user, it inherits all of the settings, it's visible on the screen for the overall assessment, and this UI is exactly the same as availability and submissions, where you have a checkbox to enable the time limit, and so on. Um, and so please uh, check out those JIRAs and, uh, and vote for them if you like them. Thanks. All right, thanks to Tiffany and John. I just wanna say, uh, you know, you guys and and others on the UX team have been doing a whole lot of work on what we called uh, gnarly workflows a couple of years ago. So just trying to find places where there are some some real great capabilities in Sakai that need to have better UI. And so thanks for all the work that you guys have been putting in. These two are the brains behind auto groups, which is already in Sakai. So uh, you know, nice nice to see them back at it. All right. So this brings us to the end of our uh, our lightning talk session. So thank you all for hanging in there with me. So it is uh, it's 1:33 p.m. So we are a little bit past time, but uh, but well worth the extra two or three minutes. So I've got a couple of of comments to give you before I, I set you free. So one is that uh, please please remember that there'll be a meeting at 2 p.m. to uh, get your feedback about the new meetings tool. So please come if you've got time. Uh, there is going to be trivia at 3.30, and uh, the organizers remind me that there is a pro host, so it's not going to be one of us slackers doing trivia. It's going to be actually someone whose job it is to do really great trivia sessions. So so come at, come at 3.30, enjoy some trivia, and have some social time with your, your fellow Aperio community members. All right, and uh, Kathy reminds us also that we have a couple of open slots left at tomorrow's lightning talk session. So if you've got something that you wanted to talk about and you hadn't had a chance yet, there is still some, there's still an opportunity to sign up. And uh, so there's information in the chat about how you can submit your idea. You can send it to Kathy at Aperio Coordinator at concentra-cms.com. So if you've got an idea, definitely feel free to, to, to sign yourself up that way. So definitely, we, Given that we've got slots and we've got lots of people with great ideas, we want to make sure that we maximize the time that we've got to learn from each other. All right, that's it. Thank you guys so much. And we'll see some of you at 2 and others of you at 3.30. All right, take care, all.